All right, 21 people. I think we're about to get started. What do I have here? 1221. All right. Um, so hopefully this will be a little bit of a short class and give you guys some break, but we will, uh, we will see. I haven't been able to do that yet. Um, so first question, what do you call a compound with a low pH and an attitude? Well, obviously, it is amine O acid. Um, so, ta-da! I ran into that one this weekend, and I thought it was worth uh, worth giving it to you guys. So, amine O acid. Um, and you need the picture as well. All right. So, what we're going to start on? Well, let's look at let's look at uh, where we are in the semester first. Let's see, we are doing a lecture on that. Here we go. So we're sitting right in this range. Keep losing my screen so I can't figure out whether you guys are seeing what you're supposed to be seeing or not. Okay, so we're sitting right in this in this range. Um, and today we're going to talk about some open source and scientific computation. You just had your test on Friday and you just turned in a week or so ago your analysis of an open source project. So my goal for the, this week is to get all of that, is to have your uh, TAs and mentors, your TA grade everything and your mentors help us out uh, with, with some of the marking, um, get all of these uh, worked out so that sometime around, well, Wednesday or Thursday, I can get you out your current grades as of this point in time, uh, which should help you, you know, I, I, the 12th is, is uh, the the last day to drop, so we're, we're hoping to get you, or we plan to get you at least one more set of grades before then, and hopefully it will have whatever um, grades we have available for you at that time. And actually, if I had had more time this morning, that was what I was going to work on next, but I ran out of time. So we're going to go with this today. Today, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about open source in scientific computation. Um, and, and by the way, that's about all that I really have for you today, uh, other than you guys should have created your projects, and uh, I haven't I haven't checked on you yet. Um, you shouldn't you should have ch you should have created your projects. If you haven't created a project yet, if you haven't submitted a project, if you don't have a project team, you know, please come and see me during office hours tomorrow or make other arrangements. We need to get you working on a project. So. Um, in the next week or so, I'm going to actually have you write up a one pager, just telling me what your project's about. Um, again, you know, this is just part of, of of getting ready. I think we may do this as a readme for your projects, um, so we'll we'll kind of uh, work through this. But you know, I do need you to get projects. I do need you to sign up. I do need to have your teams so that we can kind of move this forward, and quite honestly, so that we can plan the rest of the semester. Um, I'm going to give you time during class, or I'm going to require that you take time during class to actually talk to us and give us a presentation. Um, we'll do a little short one early uh, in the middle of a semester. Maybe we'll just do that from from a you know a single slide or something. Um, but we do want you. Uh, you will have to do a longer presentation at the end of the semester, and I need to know what you're working toward, and I need to know how many of these I need to have, and I need to know. You know how many people are on, on each team, so we can kind of plan this out. So, you know, please get that. If you haven't turned it in, and I haven't looked yet, so I don't know. Uh, if you haven't turned it in, please turn it in now, uh, so that we can kind of, like I said, so we can move forward. All right. So on with our sci scientific computation. Um, so scientific computation comes in in a lot of different ways, and what I'm going to talk about today is, you know, we're just going to give you a, a, a cannon blast of, of different places where there's open source software. I've got links for some. Uh, I go through and I revise and add and take off links as, as projects kind of fall in and out. 
uh, every year. So not everything has a link. Um, if you search hard enough, you can find something for everything. We're just going to walk through some, some different areas where there's some scientific computation going on. And then we're going to take a look at you know some specifics. And we're going to do this in the context of a physics engine and, and, uh, and actually a game. So hopefully that'll be interesting. Uh, your lab will be uh, more of a, a semantic analysis activity. So, you know, I think you'll, you'll enjoy that as well. Uh, I kind of walked through that and made sure, as far as I can tell, that one still works. Um, software dies. It, uh, it degrades as other software that it depends on uh, continues to grow. So um, this, these next four or five or six lectures are oftentimes a little bit of a challenge. Um, as I have a limited amount of time to get stuff working that worked the last time I ran it. So it's kind of fun. Um, and hopefully it's fun for you guys as well. This, this one in particular is one of my favorite lectures um, because I like, I like the activities and I, and I kind of like some of the uh, things we can derive from it. So here are our learning, learning objectives for today. Um, so scientific computation, that's kind of where I lived for most of my career. Um, so if you ask me questions about, about uh, um, JavaScript, I can muddle through. If you ask me questions about other things, I can kind of muddle through. Um, this is where I actually worked. That's why I can only muddle through on, on, uh, on like GUIs and things like that. Um, I was working on, on uh, using image processing libraries to detect and or size cancers. Um, I was working on software to do virtual environments for... Uh, for inspection cells and then process the results of non-destructive evaluation tests um, on, on comp composite materials, um, staging things so that your, your, uh, your model matched up with the actual product in a scan cell. Um, I did some things on, uh, on forensic facial reconstruction where we looked at the bone structure and tried to figure out what uh, the person looked like in real life given uh, only a skull. Um, and that was a statistical analysis based on a bunch of uh, a bunch of CT scans. So this is kind of the area where where I spent most of my career, um, and it's kind of uh, it's kind of a fun area to be in. Um, but it's not as visual and it's not as immediately gratifying as as something like doing a website, uh, where you know everything you do all of a sudden becomes magically out on the web, and everybody can see it, and it's obvious what you know how well you've done. <laughs> Whereas we're just kind of niggling around, playing with, uh, um, playing with uh, parameters, trying to 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 get just slightly better, statistically better results. So anyway, we want you to become kind of a, uh, familiar with the breadth of open source code um, used in scientific computation. We want you to gain some practical experience with open so source alternatives to closed source code. So some of the things we'll talk about um, are are, you know, just they have a direct closed source commercial equivalent um, and they have uh, they have open source variants as well and then um, here's the fun part it turns out that um, some of our more fun games actually have to be based in order for us to, to predict them and to work with them they have to be based on some kind of uh, physical environment and the same thing we may use for generating a uh, simulation system to teach somebody how to perform a surgery um, may be used to do the physics in uh, a simple game. So, you know, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of where we'll spend the bulk of the time today. And, and I, think it's a, I think it's an interesting kind of uh, segue or interesting kind of interlude. Um, I want you to look at two things today. The first is this tour of Sage Math. Sage Math is kind of like a, an alternate to Mathematica, right? So here is uh, the table of contents for that. Um, so this is a, a just a very simple um, tutorial slash introduction to Sage Math, um, but it it is a lot like Mathematica and like Mathematica, and it can do things like um, do symbolic solves for equations, um, do some plots. Uh, do some random matrices and things like that. So it's kind of a cool package. It's, it's a lot of fun. I don't have a lot of use for this most of the time. 
Uh, but if you want to do some, some, you know, nasty little mathematics and, and you don't want to pay for Mathematica, it is a real nice resource to have. And, uh, you know, we are going to ask you some questions about it for the test. Your next test, now that you're done with your first test. I will say your next and your last test. The other thing I want you to look at, because it's going to be something that we're going to work with today, is, uh, is something called PyMonk. And PyMonk is a 2D physics library. This is kind of what we're talking about when I'm talking about the simulation stuff. This, uh, this, you know, it's it's a physics library. It allows you to do to set up and solve physics equations uh, in the context of you know frames of uh, gameplay, kind of advancing on. So it's been around since two thousand and seven. It's actively developed and maintained today. More than ten years of active development, and I will say that as I discovered this weekend when I was using PyMonk. It is perhaps a little too actively developed for my liking. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, but, you know, it's it's a cool little library, and the, the current release is 6.0.0. Um, here's a quick code example. This is the physical space you're setting up. And then you can set things like gravity and you can also set um you know so so one of these is uh, applies in the x direction and one of these applies in the y direction so one you can think of as gravity and one you can think of as uh as uh viscosity or, or or wind or something like that um you can put things into the space this puts a body into the space with mass and moment and you can set positions on it and then and and you can add some uh, some visual representations, and then all this does is you step through, um, you step through. Well, this goes for infinite, which is you know maybe a little longer than than you want to do, but it just goes through and it applies the physics to the body, um, and sees where the body ends up next, and then you can come through and and use a different a different library to actually print out the results of, of what's going on. And that's kind of the structure of what we're going to be talking about at the end of class today. So you create a space. The space has its physical rules. Um, in this one, it's just got uh, uh, gravity or, you know, uh, uh, gravity and retardation uh, in, in the X direction. Actually, it doesn't have that. It's set to zero. Um, and it has one body in it. You put stuff in it, and then you let the stuff actually interact and do things. Um, so that's the stuff you should kind of be looking at. Read the first page. F familiarize yourself with the, uh, with the API reference. We're not going to, uh, you know, we're not, we're not going to uh, require you to recite the API reference from scratch. Um, if you were going to, to, if you're thinking about the next test, you probably would want to kind of download that and, and be ready for it. But that's kind of where you go. Um, whoever, I, I think Professor Morthy likes thinking in terms of this uh, scientific computation has two axes kind of thing. Uh, he always likes to look at the different aspects of, of what we're actually talking about. Um, and it takes me a, a little while, it took me a little while of teaching this course to realize that this is actually a very useful way of looking at things. Um, so... For the scientific computation, the two axes are the computations themselves and then how you get the computations, how you make them available to someone else. And these are two you know, very disjoint and different types of, uh, types of considerations. So for the computations themselves, you know, really these are computations that you're going to be investing a lot of compute time in. Uh, you may invest a lot of development time in if you're, if you're actually writing them as opposed to using them. So you want to make sure that they're written efficiently. So you want to use a language that allows you to implement them efficiently. Um, you're probably talking about a C, a C++, or a Fortran kind of thing. In, in really extreme cases, you might be dropping down to assembler. Um, but these back-end computations are the bulk of the work in the system. The rest of the system may not actually be useful in terms of, uh, of you know, the language you use to develop these, these high 
high uh, intensity computations may not be the best vehicle for communicating back to a GUI or to some system that really uh, is speaking a visual language where you want to talk to, for example, um, a game designer or graphical kind of utilities to display stuff and make things pretty and, and make the game uh, visually and conceptually interesting. So, you know, we need this heavy lifting part. We need to make this heavy lifting part as fast as possible, as useful as possible, and as powerful as possible. Um, but we don't need that same power or that same considerations when we're actually looking at uh, using the code. And that is where these two different axes come in, right? We have the axis of computation, and then we have the axis of communication. How do we commu communicate ourselves back to, uh, you know, back to the back to the game or the calling program or the scientific simulation? So, with that in mind, back in computations, you know, if you're a C, C++, Fortran guy or or girl or person or um, you know, whatever whatever your pronouns are, um, you know, these are generally written in those languages, right? You're not going to use something like Python, which is an interpret, interpreted language with a substantial amount of overhead. You're going to use something like, you know, C++ or C, uh, where you get very close contact with the hardware. Um, if you're dealing with something like haptics, where you're getting feedback, you know, you're going to have to be really close to the hardware. Um, so you're going to want to be down there working in an efficient manner, minimizing the amount of time spent in the computations because you'll have to do enough computations that um, time will be uh, hard anyway. Oftentimes, because of this difficulty and because things, you know, for games, for example, there are a lot of uh, physics engines for games, um, that physics part is kind of a necessary evil, right? You need the physics so that you can simulate um, you know, stomping on your uh, on your undead uh, wizard or something like that, or somebody else stomping on your undead wizard in, in, in World of Warcraft. Um, you know, you need to be able to fall. You need to be able to bump into things and bounce off or bump into things and take damage, detect collisions. Um, but that's not really where the popular, popularity of the game comes in. I mean, in some sense, the physical realism plays a part. But in another sense, the physical realism is an underlying um, world that just is. And the, and the success of the game is more along the lines of uh, how well did we tell a story around the game or how well did we present interesting challenges around the game. And that really uses the physics, but that it's separate from the physics. So because of that, that means that these physics packages are perfect targets for open source, right? Because you and I can, you know, let's say we, we're in competing game companies, we can collaborate on making our physics engines better. And making our physics engines better are going to improve both of our, uh, the, the ability, are going to improve the, the number of tools we have for telling a story or for making a game. But you and I aren't competing on the phys physics engine. We're competing on the story. And our ultimate success or failure is going to be um, helped by the physics engine, but the ultimate success and failure and the differentiator between uh, me and you is probably going to be something else. It's going to be in the gameplay itself. So because of that, these physics engines are, are prime, con uh, prime targets for open source um, development, right? Because you and I still have the secret sauce that we can use to make money. That's our ability to tell a story, to write an interesting game, to write a visually compelling game. Um, and this is a nice... It's, it's, an, it's a requirement. We need to have this. But you and I aren't differentiated, differentiated on this. So you, I can improve something that helps you, and you can improve something that helps me, and I'm no poorer than before. In fact, I'm richer, and you're no poorer than before, and you're richer. So it's a perfect kind of ground for fruitful uh, collaborations, even among competitors. Um, and it's another place where, you know, when, when you have that type of collaborative environment, um, where collaborations are easily enabled in the, these types of environments. It's one of the places where going it alone is actually putting you at a disadvantage. So let's say um, you and I are collaborating and, uh, and Kevin, our TA, comes in and he wants to compete against both of us. 
we're collaborating on an engine. We can keep up with Kevin's development using half of our, half the resources Kevin has to, you know, assuming, you know, a, 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 a nice steady curve of, of development um, effort versus uh, out, uh, effort versus accomplishment, right? You and I have to only invest half the amount of effort that Kevin has to invest. And if we get 10 people working on it, then it's 10% of the amount of effort that Kevin has to put in. And it's one of the places where open source really has an advantage because you kind of eat these problems from the bottom up, right? In order to keep up with us, Kevin has to spend more and more of his cycles developing something that is necessary for his product, but isn't the differentiator on his project, which leaves less and less time and less and less funds to actually invest in the differentiator part. So it's one of the places where you see uh, ground swells where, where you start off with a, with a premier closed source solution and then people see the success of that and they start creating open source variants and it kind of eats the competition because the premier system to, to maintain premier has to put in substantially more, more effort, substantially more resources than any of the individual contributors uh, to the open source, uh, uh, to the open source F X effort. Um, so you see a lot in, in uh, so, you know, what this boils down to is when you have something that's hidden that no one cares about, but it's important, there's probably an open source alternative. Um, so this line says use them, and I'll stand by that. Um, if there are open source alternatives that kind of meet your goals, you should always give them a, give them a thought, particularly if they're still actively develop, developed or if they're leaders in the field, right? Just jumping onto any open source system is probably not going to give you the bang you want. You need to have development, you need to have scale of development on it. Um, but you know, when there's a popular open source alternative, it's kind of hard to compete against it. Um, and the cool thing is the people that are generally contributing to this, or at least some of the people that contribute to this, are people who have interests in the area, right? I mean, that kind of makes sense. Um, so that means you're going to have experts in physics and mathematics, if you're doing climate studies, climate modeling, circuit designers, financial experts, etc. You know, so you can expect that you have, by, by having this big community um, and certain problems of interest to, to narrow uh, kind of fields, you can expect that you'll have in experts in this specific discipline actually validating and using and creating um, these different modules. Now, we talked about a lot of stuff. Um, the final thing I want to say here, at least on this slide, is that in general, if you're doing a computation, you know, a, a large-scale computation, you know, a multi-body simulation, uh, finite element simulation, if you're doing something, you know, evaluating multiple targets of an AI, you're going to use parallelism. Um, so if you're looking to, if you really like doing parallel code, this is another place to look. Most of these libraries or a lot of these libraries or, or toolkits or functions will have an ability to, to be parallel, um, which is kind of cool. Um, and a nice place to work if you enjoy that kind of thing. And that kind of thing is fun and, and fun to debug. All right. So, testing is a big deal, right? Um, now, maybe not so much in gameplay, you know, do you care if you're off by, you know, a, a tenth of a pixel or something like that? Maybe, maybe not. You know, maybe your collisions uh, are skewed a little bit. But if you're doing something where you're actually going to use this, for example, to prove out the Boeing 777, um, you're going to want to make sure that everything works. Oftentimes, the investment in generating code in C, C++, Fortran, some of these, these lower level, high level languages uh, is fairly substantial. So oftentimes what you'll find out is that you know, these algorithms, at least pieces of the algorithms, the mathematical components are going to be tested out in something else first. And if you took CS1 here, um, and if you took it from me in particular, we talked about sorting algorithms and uh, you know, we kind of said, you know, in, in general, and, and when we did, we talked about efficiency, and we kind of said, in general, what you do is you write it in the easiest way you can. You know, if you have to, you can use you can use Python, you can use whatever language of choice, and then when you find out that it's part of the core of what you need to do, and you're going to call it 10 million times, well, then you put in the investment to make it fast. And the sorting algorithm, that's why the Python 
native sorting algorithm was so much faster than the ones we wrote using Python. Um, the ones in the ones used by Python were written in C or C++. Um, so right off the bat, they had a computational advantage, um, and you know they were also highly tuned, efficient algorithms um, that had had a lot of effort put into making them computationally efficient. Although I think in general they were all uh, variants of of the same. Uh, Was it what is uh, merge sort or something maybe? Anyway, um, almost everything scientific is big means they have to have arrays. So for example, um, my when I was in graduate school here, uh, my thesis was on fast solution methods for systems of equations arising from the finite element uh, method applied to uh, to large grids. Um, the output of all that is just, in the end, a huge matrix, matrix that has to be solved, a huge, actually very sparse, lots of zeros, uh, rays that needed to be solved. And that type of, uh, first off, finite element computations are pretty extensively used in things like 3D games um, and 3D uh, simulations. Um, but on top of that, um, you know, most of the time, you're dealing with interactions between multiple bodies, multiple constraints, um, and these always or almost always arise, uh, uh, result in these large multi multi-dimensional, two, three-dimensional arrays. Um, and this just kind of, if you're doing science, scientific computations, you're probably using double precision. Um, let's give you some examples. All of these are actually stuff I've worked in or with. This first one is Open Surge Sim. Um, this was, was, right, the last update was, actually, this, the last update to the homepage was in, uh, 2013. This went on until 2019, maybe 2020. Um, but this is, uh, so I'm going to have to actually kill this at some point. Um, but this is uh, a project, an open source project for simulating, um, it's a surgical simulation. So it is a physics engine uh, using discretized space where the things they're trying to discretize are things like bodies, um, wounds, uh, uh, sutures. Uh, I actually worked on this one um, on a suture model. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, right, a doctor tries to tie a knot. And I should have had a piece of string. Well, you wouldn't be able to see a piece of string anyway. Let me grab a cable. We use my watch charger. So um, a doctor tries to tie a knot. Right? And so you take your... Huh, it's dropping out. So you take your suture and you tie a knot and then you pull it. And all along this area you have two things in contact that are applying force to one another, otherwise your rope doesn't close. And on a thin piece of wire, there's a, a, an immense acceleration in this area. I worked for a year on making sure that when these two things were pulled, that we had enough time continuity so that this didn't pass right through the other side of the string. Um, because you have to solve that either you have to either solve that really really fast at speeds beyond what you need to solve the rest of the system, um, you know things like poking the rib or something. Um, so you either need to solve that really really fast, or you need a way to use extended dimensions, include time as a spatial dimension, and predict whether any crossing could have occurred uh, within that entire time period. So that was a lot of fun. I spent a year on that, um, and these guys. You know what? I just realized that I didn't actually put this thread over. So, you know, the key is when you're tying a knot, you kind of you kind of do something like that. And then here, you know, up here where we're hitting, right, if that doesn't pull against one another, the knot doesn't tie. In fact, what happens is the just turns into a string without a knot. Um, so this undergoes a lot of acceleration, and it's very thin. Um, and so that's where we need to to, to figure out 
methods for not crossing the line, not crossing the streams, if you're familiar with uh, <sighs> Ghostbusters. All right. So this is a real cool one. Um, it's I think it's been... There was one out in France that I think probably beat it finally. Um, but it was a lot of fun to work on, and it's still out there. And I think the last commit... was, yeah, um, October of, of last year. Um, so this is still good. It's still viable. It's not all that old. Uh, if, if one of you, it is open source, if one of you want to take it over, um, you know, be my guest. You can start contributing to it. Uh, I still know the people who probably have all the commit passwords and everything like that. Um, so, you know, kind of keep that in mind. It's a, it's a good one. Um, and there's a whole, you know, they have a whole environment here that tells you how to use it, how to pull it together with examples. They use YAML files for configuring things, etc. Um, the other part about this that was interesting was this had a haptics environment. Uh, haptics are those feedback devices. When you press on them, they press back. Um, so if you're trying to teach somebody to, to, to tie a suture, you actually have them hold a forceps connected to a machine with goggles in a virtual environment and actually practice tying uh, the suture that way. Um, we also had a, a, a hand-driven borehole um, simulator for um, putting holes in your head if you needed an extra hole or two, um, you know, essentially to relieve pressure or as part of a surgical procedure. Um, Eigen is a big, I want to say library, but it's not really the kind of library you would actually think about. Eigen is um, essentially... A template library. So if you're in, into C++, um, you can do, it has, you know, dense matrix computations, sparse matrices, uh, numeric types, matrix decompositions, and you don't really need anything here because it is... Um, Template, it's a template header library. Um, they use CMake. They use that so that they can test their code, right? This is scientific code, scientific code. Absolutely, all code needs to be tested. Scientific code absolutely needs to be tested. Um, a little error can make everything go go um, bottom up. You know, if you if you make a mistake in your in your matrix decomposition uh, in your last iteration when you're trying to make it faster, you could affect every other routine um, in the uh, in, in the library essentially. So they have a make system. The make system allows you to build the documentation of the unit tests um, and to put everything where you want it put. But Eigen is just a set of header files in C++ that are enormously te templated and very hard to work through and figure out, but it's extremely powerful. Um, and it allows you to do, well, essentially this was the underlying mathematics we used for uh, Open Surge Sim and other places. And free software, it's licensed under MPL2, weak copy left, right? So you can, you can find all that. Earlier versions were, were LGPL3, which is kind of funny because this is all templates and the LGPL essentially was for um, library. Uh, it, it's it's the, the GNU license for uh, using libraries, essentially. Okay, um, did we ever look at the license for Open Search Sim? I think this is GPL. No, no, I'm sorry. I think it's MIT. There we go. Apache. Okay, good enough. Apache's good enough. Um, all right, so that that one's Apache. Um, Another one is ITK. This is another one that I that I worked on when I was. Uh, this is one of the ones that's managed uh, largely by Kitware up in New York. Um, this, you know, they make a whole business out of this. They will do consulting on this library to build you, help you build what you want, um, and then you can walk away from them and you never have to see them again. And you can find another ITK developer uh, to, uh, to 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 take care of it if you'd like. Um, 
They also have an, uh, an entire build system and, and testing system. I am now looking for the license. Ah, restore the license. Actually, overwritten, uh, accidentally overwritten by a merge commit. Okay, they're under the Apache license too. I, I think at one point they were under the M MIT or BSD. This looks like this may be a recent 2004. No, that's the Apache license of 2004. Anyway, so they're they're under Apache as well. Um, the ITK consortium. This is a is a, a set of modules. It, it, this is a, is not a set of header libraries. This is a, and in fact, I think some parts of this actually make use of Eigen as well. Um, but this is uh, do we have the readme here? It's a toolkit for insight uh, for insight into meta, primarily medical imaging. So it's a segmentation and registration toolkit. So what it allows you to do is given a two or three or more degree um, image, it allows you to go in and detect, uh, write algorithms to detect things within that image. I used it a lot for uh, lung cancers or uh, colon polyps or brain tumors. Um, but it's also been used for, you know, computer vision, et cetera. Um, and then register two versions of the same thing, even if they're in a different modality. So if you have any experience in medical imaging, uh, MRIs look vastly different than CTs. Um, and sometimes you want to see what the MRI image looks like in the area, in the vicinity of something you see in the CT. And so you have to put them together and register them, or you're doing time studies, so you want to register them and see did something grow or get smaller. So that's largely what um, this is about. This has been going on since 2002 or three, I think, somewhere in that time frame. Um, and, it, and it's a consortium effort too. So I, I talk about uh, about Kitware. They are the the primary keepers of the of the repository, um, but there are all sorts of contributors. Different colleges, Harvard's contributed. Um, uh, the Ski Institute in Utah, um, GE. Um, so there's a lot of different, a um, lot of a lot of different. Um, you know, this is not a Kitware thing. This is Kitware is one of the people who work on this, uh, and they're one of the people who make a, who make a living off this. Uh, and like a lot of these things, right? They have a code of conduct. I think the one thing that I didn't actually show you that maybe I should on any of these is all of these systems have testing. There we go. Um, ITK uses C dash and C test, which are uh, C make utilities for testing. And they test on at least hundreds, if not thousands of machines every day. Each one of these is a specific installation on a specific machine or operating system reporting, um, you know, configuration errors, build errors, testing errors, etc. Um, and there are several thousand tests now. Is that true? Um, experimental nightly. Let's look at the nightly. Yeah, they have 2,900 and some tests. Um, for this one, 34 gave warnings, 4 gave errors, and 72 weren't run because of probably some configuration or an error in, uh, in the build. I'm sorry, and this was only, this was only for the build. Um, 2,917 actually passed. 72 weren't run because of these errors. All right. Uh, any questions before I kind of take it out from here? We're just going to go through a large number of these, I think, for, for, for now. We'll just, I've, sh I've shown you kind of some in detail. Um, okay. Uh, if you have any questions, raise your hand or, or type it into the chat. I do check periodically. You'll you'll know that because if I'm not holding the coffee cup and I pause, uh, I'm pausing to uh, to read the chat and see if there's anything going on. If I pause and I'm and I'm holding the coffee cup, I'm probably taking a sip of coffee so I don't choke and die right here in front of you. 
Um, all right, so there's a lot of there's a lot of these libraries out there. They do different things. Uh, they do compete with one another. I wish I could think of the competitor to Open Surge Sim because I uh, I have some friends that uh, I think left Open Surge Sim as it was downsizing and and moved over to the other one in France. Um, so it's probably a pretty good library as well. I'd like to check it out. I will at some point. Um, so these are, are kind of, you know, some of the computation engines, some of the things you can see. And then you can kind of look at applications of this. So um, structural safety, finite element modeling, you know, if you're a structural engineer, um, you will use these libraries to do um, structural engineering stuff, fluid mechanics, uh, circuit simulation. If you go to Arcos, for example, and I probably should have gone there. Um, this is not your biggest, uh, circuit simulation project, but the very first project because of embedded white space characters in alphabetical order or lexicographical order. If you remember CS1 on the Arcos page is open circuits, trying to compete with another project called Spice. Um, so you know, circuit design is there. Um, genomics and drug simulation. Uh, let's see what I have for this. Is this the one out of Penn State? Hmm. Anyways, if you want to do uh, genome analysis, um, this is available out of uh, Hamburg is one of the groups. So that would be in, in Germany. Um, you know, you can look at their license. This is licensed under a very short open BSD modeled license um, called the ISC license. I actually looked and uh, the ISC license is approved by uh, the open uh, OSI. ISC is approved by OSI. Um, so, you know, if you want to do genome uh, and genomics and drug simulation, you can do that. I think this probably goes back to ITK. Oh, no, this goes to 3D Slicer. 3D Slicer is built um, by... Uh, hmm. Is this MGH? Uh, Brigham and Women's. Yeah, so this was originated by Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, but it uses uh, ITK as a computational front end, a back end, and I believe it uses QT as the front end uh, to put together something that allows you to, to do these uh, segmentation operations. Like this is pulling out, that looks like the bronchus from the lungs. Um, this is ca probably calculating a, yeah, so this is inside the brain. This is calculating a neural pathway kind of, you know, which neurons are connected to which neurons, a flow field. Um, this looks like hmm, the heart and ribs, maybe. I have to, I'd have to look at that one. That may be actually, that may, may be, actually the, be the, the inside the brain as well. Yeah, that's, that's some of the chambers inside the brain. Um, that is a cancer, or at least a, uh, it looks like a breast um, lesion. So anyway, um, this is an application an open application of ITK to do scientific computations regarding uh, medical imaging primarily. The cool thing is that um, it's infinitely extensible. If you write your own algorithm, I think you can actually write it in Python uh, using Python bindings to, to ITK or whatever module, whatever uh, other tool you want. You can actually incorporate those into the slicer interface and get slicer to do your visualization for you showing what you're what you're picking out what you're not picking out um the downside is this was written by engineers and, and doctors so i haven't looked at it in, in the last year or two um but this tends to be one of those um overly complex solutions that you actually have to learn in order to be able to use effectively um that said it's very powerful it's, it's a really cool thing and it's um you know been around for quite some time. I don't really... like their Slicer license. 
Um, they claim that it's compatible with the open source definition and it's a BSD style open source license. Um, no restrictions on use of the software, but I don't believe that they actually have a formal name for it. And I don't know, it may be, it may not be. I don't know that it's actually been accepted by the OSI, um, but it is pretty, pretty open. Um, most of these are to protect you from, uh, um, protect them from you uh, more than protect you from them. see airline scheduling astronomy and space computations this used to point to SETI but I just found out that since I used this course last uh, SETI at home has been shut down and they're no longer using crowdsourcing um, I couldn't find out whether it was open source but they're not using crowdsourcing uh, they have a bunch of uh, analysis that needs to be done on the data and uh, it's not clear to me whether that part is being done open source or not yeah wasn't that a, a real bummer um Apparently not. I just went there, um, and I've had it running on, on different machines at different times, um, and I just went there to, to kind of visit it as part of this, um, and it's not there. It's, it's still there. Um, the claim is that they're, they've, they've uh, accumulated so much data that they have a backlog, and now they have to analyze it, and the guy wants to graduate. So he is going to take the place, the, 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 the model where he has the most control over getting himself to graduation as opposed to opening this up as an open source project. He wants to be out in a year or two, I guess. Um, for so many years ago now. I remember it from so many years ago. Um, so anyway, they're, they're doing the final analysis of all the data and, and trying to pull out anomalies. Um, but it's not actually open at this time. And hopefully it'll come back or something similar will come back or what they learn from this will result in something similar. Um, you can do simulations of materials, you know, uh, simulated annealing is simulation of annealing, which is actually a process that help that materials go through. But more than that, you can do simulation of materials. You can do manufacturing process. You can do this from a lot of different ways. You can do, for example, if you're doing casting of, of, uh, of plastic things, you can do flow analysis, or you can do some of the things that I did previously, which was modeling uh, a mechanical, you know, not, not really an assembly line, but a testing, a testing station. Um, and modeling all the all the interactions in a virtual environment of of what uh, it was a laser scanner head um, it would set up ultrasonic vibrations by hitting a material with a high speed laser or a high powered laser sets up vibrations in the material you can read the vibrations just like a normal ultrasound we did the entire scan cell uh, in in a virtual environment in pastel colors because the guy I was working for liked pastels it was ugly as anything um, but it did work. Um, network simulations, you'll get into that a little bit in the lab using networks. Uh, weapon simulation and modeling, solving MP hard complete problems, protein folding. They've actually made games out of protein folding um, so that people can, can solve protein folding uh, problems. Um, and then physics engines for game playing that we'll get into soon. And one of my favorites is chemistry, which is, um, if you come out here, open chemistry is a big kind of... Uh, I think fold it is right um, for the protein folder. Um, open chemistry, this is one of the ones that, that's one of my favorites because I'm, uh, I'm friends with the guy who runs a lot of this. So molecule, um, you know, it's part of the open chemistry projects. Again, Kitware has, um, will often hire somebody who's able to support themselves um, and let them work on their libraries and then try to help them make a, you know, get customers and things. This is Marcus Handwell. Um, he doesn't normally wear the mask. I mean, he does normally this year, um, but he was working at Kitware for a while, but he's just moved out to Brookhaven National uh, Laboratory. Uh, he's been working in, in open chemistry for a while um, on this, uh, both on, on this molecule and upon on something called Avogadro. Um, so if you're interested in, in open chemistry, if you're interested in chemistry, this is kind of a real, it's kind of a cool um, molecular editor designed for cross-platform use. So, so in other words, you can go in and you can kind of set up molecules and see if, if they meet your predictions. And it's a really interesting, uh, 
and then simulate what happens with them. Uh, so he's a CS chemistry kind of uh, dual kind of guy. Um, him I don't know. Chris Harris is another kitware guy. At least he was at some point. Um, okay. What else do I have here? I have a whole. I have page after page of these. MATLAB. Um, if you're doing open, uh, open uh, scientific computing development, not all of these are open source, but you probably will use a lot of them. Um, you can use MATLAB, uh, Maple, Sage. We looked at Sage already. Mathematica. Um, and then you can use something like Octave, which is a open source uh, uh, re a replacement for MATLAB, although I don't know that it has Simulink. Um, CUDA, CUDA, there's all sorts of open MPI libraries for parallel computation. Uh, LIMPAC and ICEPAC, these are libraries to do matrix computations out of NetLib. Uh, these are not uh, 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 template libraries. These are actually, a lot of them are either C code or old Fortran code. Um, that probably compiles under C now, um, but they're, um, you know, matrix computation, et cetera, uh, GLPK, linear programming, um, GNU linear programming kit. Um, you know, anything GNU is going to be licensed probably under a GNU license. Huh. They don't explicitly say, but they do say it's part of the GNU project. So I expect this is probably... GNU 3, probably. And as we kind of go through this, you can see the different, the different uh, ways projects use to communicate back to their, back to their uh, users. Like this is just a really simple wiki like page uh, right and you can come through here and they're all linked together they have mailing lists to talk to one another um, you know there's not a real fancy um, website or anything so it's just basically this page here um, and then you get to something like open chemistry now well, this is essentially uh, a GNU thing you get to Slicer, right? This is an entire, an entire wiki universe with you know dozens of, of links and training available, so you can go and get tutorials. Um, you can go to the developer fac or the discussion forum or the user Q and A, um, right? So there's, it's just a, a different levels of effort depending upon the community and the size of the community that you need to support. Um, All right, what else do we have? Oh, ACM has a collected algorithms. Um, a lot of a lot of algorithms that you want can be found in ACM. There are finite element packages. Boink for distributed volunteer copy, computation that that was used for Milky Way at home. Uh, the visualization toolkit. This is another uh, Kitware project. Um, this is open source. I wonder if they've changed to. Uh, I wonder if they've changed to. Uh, Trying to find the license. The user's guide, by the way, is published. You can buy it, um, but it is also a free PDF uh, under C under uh, 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 CC Creative Commons license. Let's see, and they also have. Hopefully their license up here. Hmm. I'm not gonna. Ch I'm not gonna chase it too much farther. BSD. Okay, so IT, uh, VTK is BSD three clause. 
And instead of under the license file, it's in copyright.txt, of course. There you go. Um, you know, Insight Toolkit, we looked at already. OpenCV is another one um, for, you know, computer vision. Uh, ITK is more for registration and segmentation. Uh, CV allows you to do more things, although, you know, I, I think there's substantial overlap between the two. Um, yeah, we've been talking for a long time. Now let's go to the one more. OpenCV is cool. Right, so if you're, if you're actually looking for an open source... Uh, computer vision library, um, it's here, and uh, they have a competition going on right now. So that, that's kind of interesting. Let's see. Let's see if they have the license in the about. What I like about this is they have this uh, not appropriate questions, which is kind of which is kind of interesting, and means that they had a lot of those questions going on, um, and they believe they've answered it enough. Uh, code has to be BSD. Okay, and then of course we have Python. Um, Python, you you may be aware of Python. Uh, my son's leaving for college, so I just had to wave to, to tell him goodbye. Um, again, he's leaving for college. He's there on trimesters, so this is the start of his last semester. Uh, anyway, Python, you know, everybody knows Python is, is open source. Um, what you may not be aware of is they're trying to transition leadership. At least two years ago, um, there was a big posting saying that the, the person who's been running uh, um, Python was stepping down and... Uh, It was curious at the time whether Python would thrive or stagnate, and it looks like it's doing just absolutely fine, which is good. They reached enough scale that there's enough people interested in keeping it going. Um, that's one of the issues with, with open source projects that are driven by, by one person. Um, and, and, you know, it's great that they are kind of making it. Um, there's other languages, by the way. Um, Julia, High Performance Numerical and Scientific Computation Language. Uh, R, if you're doing statistics, if you're doing any statistical analysis of experiments, uh, you'll probably want to use R. Um, it's another open source language. They have, um, at least they have in previous years, had a conference every year, which is really hard to find in Google because it's the Use R conference, no spaces, right? So Use R is user, U-S-E-R. So you can Google user um, and you'll get all sorts of conferences, um, but that they're a, a big, a big statistical community, very old project. Uh, they've been around for, uh, probably the, the eighties or nineties. I'd have to, I'd have to look that up again. Um, we'll, we'll talk, we might talk about those next week. It's on the schedule for next week, but we may also do something else. We'll have to see. Um, and then Cytoscape, um, which is kind of a cool little Java open source license for network data integration analysis and visualization in a box. Um, so there's all sorts of uh, different things here as well. And I'm tired of looking for licenses. You would think you would put your license right out on the, on the, uh, like that should be the first thing you see is the, is the license or at least a link to it. Um, All right, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna track down this one. You guys are purely competent at tracking down, uh, tracking down the license. I like when it comes up up here. If you pick a standard license, it just comes up here, and you can see it, and you're done. All right.